this is a symposium uh, organized uh, by the multidisciplinary program in uh, inequality and social policy and this is uh, one of a number of uh, occasional events that we'll be hosting uh, in the course of the year. I hope everyone has uh, seen the flyer for our uh, colloquium series, the Monday Inequality Seminar, uh, which is on uh, Mondays uh, at noon, uh, that will be uh, next door, actually, in uh, Sejus uh, South 20. We have a, a superb panel uh, today to uh, discuss Bill's book. I'm, I'm very grateful uh, to uh, Sudhir uh, Venkatesh coming in from Columbia today, Orlando Patterson from the, uh, the sociology department here at Harvard, and uh, my, uh, my other great colleague in the, uh, the sociology department, Michelle Lamont, uh, will uh, moderate the session. So uh, let me uh, kick things off uh, by uh, introducing Michelle. Thank you very much. Well, I first want to thank Bruce for organizing this event, which uh, by our account is the event of the start of the year. There's been a great sense of uh, anticipation and buzz in our department, so we uh, all have uh, followed uh, the reception of uh, Bill's book last spring. It received a great deal of media attention, and of course many of our students have already uh, read the book, so I'm extremely delighted to have been asked by um, Bruce to moderate this event. All I hope is I won't have to moderate too much and we'll all moderate ourselves. Um, so why this session? Well, of course, uh, as we all know, Bill uh, Wilson is an extremely influential uh, scholar. He's not only an influential scholar, but he's also a beloved, uh, generous and splendid colleague. So we're uh, organizing this session not only to honor and discuss, an honor by discussing his scholarship, but also to thank him for all he does for our community. I'm particularly pleased to be part of this because as a cultural sociologist interested in inequality, I've been engaged with Bill in a conversation over the last few years about the role of uh, culture in explaining uh, poverty, uh, its role in contributing to processes and mechanisms that uh, uh, reproduce and produce uh, inequality and poverty. And that discussion, I think, is becoming inf increasingly influential. So we know that during the 1970s and 1980s, culture was something of a third rail among poverty researchers and policy experts. Uh, criticisms of Oscar Lewis's culture and poverty thesis and Moynihan 1965 report on the Negro family led to a backlash against invoking culture to understand the intergenerational uh, transmission of poverty, which came to be seen as blaming the victim. Since then, most poverty experts have shied away from employing uh, cultural explanations. In the meantime, however, culture scholars have developed new theoretical tools, concepts such as repertoire, frame, habitus, narrative, symbolic boundaries. The field of sociology itself was revolutionized from within. In the early 1980s, cultural sociology was basically a very small and marginal field. It's now the largest section of the American Sociological Association with the largest number of graduate students, so it's a field that is booming. And there hadn't been as much dialogue between uh, cultural analysts and experts in the field of uh, poverty and in, well, poverty. So Bill's work plays a very important role in trying to uh, uh, really feed that debate. Bill's uh, own work had been concerned with culture for a long time, already in the truly disadvantaged. He uh, attacks the culture uh, of poverty argument and uh, uh, distinguishes his uh, social uh, isolation argument by saying that social isolation plays strong emphasis on the autonomous character of the cultural traits once they become, come into existence. In, o that, in other words, these traits assume a life of their own and continue to influence behavior even as opportunities and social mobility improve. On the other hand, social isolation links ghetto-specific behavior with the problem of social organization. In his most recent book, More Than Just Race, he, uh, he in some way shifts his position and really marks a clear opening toward cultural analysis where he urges race scholars to investigate objects of study such as cultural repertoire, 
habitus, style, skills, and the micro level of meaning making and decision making reflected in cultural frame, defined as shared group construction of reality. He speaks as well of shared outlook, tradition, belief system, worldviews, preference, manners, linguistic pattern, modes of behavior. And these cultural formation, he affirms, can themselves exert, exert an independent and autonomous power creating and reinforcing social structures despite being generated by them. Of course, I will leave it to him to qualify his position further as he will uh, start the session by uh, summarizing his arguments. So the agenda is that uh, Bill will first introduce the book. He's asked me to take 20 minutes or so to do, to do this and then um, uh, Professor Patterson and um, Venkatesh will uh, have each roughly 20 minutes to, um, to uh, or 15, 20 minutes to uh, present their comments and open a conversation. And then Bill will take just a few minutes to respond and then we'll leave it, we'll open it uh, to uh, the audience. Unfortunately, we have to leave at six. So my role is partly to make sure that we have at least 30 minutes left uh, for a room conversation here. So a few words to uh, introduce our participants, starting with uh, Orlando Patterson, another beloved colleague, a historical and cultural sociologist. He is the John Calls Professor of Sociology here, a recipient of the National Book Award for Nonfiction for his book, Freedom in the Making of Western Culture. He's also the author of several books that are classics in the study of race and inequality in the United States and beyond, books such as Ethnic Chauvinism, Slavery and Social Debt, The Ordeal of Integration, and Ritual of Blood. An intellectual of remarkable breadth, he's also the author of three novels, one of which, The Children of Sisyphus, was published in 1964, before he joined the Harvard faculty at a very early age. I don't know exactly what page, but I know it was very early. <laughs> A public intellectual, agent provocateur, and wise maverick who remains highly respected by his peers, Professor Patterson was for eight years the special advisor for social policy and development to Prime Minister Michael Manley of J Jamaica. He was a founding member of Cultural Survival, one of the leading advocacy groups for the rights of indigenous people, and was for several years a board member of Freedom House, a major civic organization for the promotion of freedom and democracy around the world. Uh, he is also noted for his uh, being a regular guest columnist in the New York Times, and his columns have appeared in Time Magazine, Newsweek, The Public Interest, The New Republic, and The Washington Post, and we all read him with great interest, always. Sudhir Venkatesh is the William B. Ransford Professor of Sociology at Columbia. Uh, in the state of New York. He's a researcher and writer on urban neighborhood in the United States, as well as a documentary filmmaker. His most recent book is Gang Leader for a Day, published by Penguin, which has received a Best Book Award from The Economist, is undergoing translation in several languages. His uh, previous work of the books, uh, uh, The Underground Economy of the Urban Poor, uh, was about illegal economies in Chicago, and it receives the Best Book Award from Slate.com, as well as the C. Wright Mills Award. His first book, American Project, The Rise and Fall of the Modern Ghetto, explored life in Chicago public housing. His other writings and stories have appeared in The American Prospect, The Chicago Tribune, and the other places. Other ongoing projects include a study of migration settle and settlement in the suburbs of Paris, a project I didn't know about, an in-depth study of re-entry among the formerly incarcerated in New York, and long-term project on sex works in New York and Chicago with Steve Levitt, a longtime collaborator. His next book will focus on the role of the black market in the revitalization of New York in the last decade. Finally, Bill Wilson, William Julius Wilson, is Lewis P. and Linda L. Geiser University Professor at Harvard University. After a distinguished career at the University of Chicago, he joined Harvard faculty in 1996, where he's one of only 19 university professors. So Bill Wilson is the author of numerous books, including the, the, all classics, Declining Signification of Ra Significance of Race, which is the winner of the American Sociological Association's Sydney uh, Spivak Award, The Truly Disadvantage, which was selected by the editor of the New York Times Book Review as one of the 16 best books of 1987. I will skip all the awards because we're, you're mostly interested in hearing what Bill has to say. Uh, 
Um, so I will stop here and give the podium to Bill. I want to take about 20 minutes to uh, provide an overview and sort of frame the discussion the way I want it to be framed. <laughs> uh, in this book, uh, I had hoped to uh, further our understanding of the complex and uh, interrelated factors uh, that uh, continue to uh, contribute to racial inequality uh, in the United States. And in the process, uh, I call for re-examining the way uh, social scientists discuss two important factors associated with racial inequality, uh, social structure and culture. And many of the arguments I uh, developed uh, in this book were influenced uh, by uh, the writings of uh, members of this uh, distinguished uh, panel, uh, Michelle, Orlando, and uh, Sadir. Now, although the book uh, highlights uh, the experiences of inner city African Americans, uh, I emphasize that the uh, complexities of understanding uh, race and inequality in America are not limited to our research on blacks. Uh, formal and informal aspects of inequality have also victimized Latinos, uh, Asian Americans, and uh, Native Americans. In this book, however, I use the uh, research on inner city uh, African Americans to uh, elaborate my uh, <coughs> analytic framework because they have been the central focus of the structure uh, versus culture dispute. Now, the book uh, will likely generate controversy, and I read some of the blogs, it's already generated some controversy, uh, because I take uh, culture seriously as one of the explanatory variables in the study of race and urban poverty, you know, a topic that's typically uh, considered off limits in academic discourse because of a fear that such analysis can be construed as blaming uh, the victim. Uh, indeed, I develop a framework that integrates structural forces uh, ranging from those that are racial, such as segregation and discrimination, uh, to those that are non-racial, such as changes in the economy, and cultural forces to not only show how the two, structure and culture, are inextricably linked, but also to explain why structural forces should receive far more attention than cultural factors in accounting for the social outcomes of poor African Americans and in framing public policies to address racial inequality. Now when I speak of culture, I'm referring to the sharing of outlooks and modes of behavior among individuals who face similar place-based circumstances, such as poor segregated neighborhoods. Therefore, when individuals act according to their culture, they are following inclinations developed from their exposure to the particular traditions, practices, and beliefs among those who live and interact in the same physical and social environment. Now, this definition is not limited to uh, conceptions of culture defined in the simple and traditional terms of group norms, values, and attitudes toward uh, family and work. It also includes cultural repertoires, you know, habits, styles, skills, and the micro-level processes of meaning-making and decision-making. That is a way that individuals in particular groups, communities, or societies develop an understanding of how the world works and make decisions based on that understanding. Uh, the processes of meaning-making and decision-making are reflected in cultural frames, that is, shared group constructions of reality. And in my book, I use the generic concept of cultural traits to refer to one or more of these different but related components of culture. Now, there are two types of cultural traits relevant to the study of race and urban poverty. One represents national views and beliefs on race, and the other uh, embodies patterns of intra-group interaction in settings created by discrimination and segregation, 
that reflect collective experiences within those settings. When we talk about the impact of cultural traits, we're also making explicit references to the forces they set in motion given specific social circumstances which affect human behavior. Accordingly, I emphasize in the book that distinct cultural traits uh, in the inner city have not only, not only been shaped by race and poverty, but in turn often shape responses to poverty, including responses that may contribute to the perpetuation of poverty. Indeed, you know, one of the effects of living in racially segregated neighborhoods is exposure to group specific cultural traits, you know, orientations, habits, worldviews, styles of behavior, particular skills that emerge from patterns of racial exclusion and that may not be conducive to factors that facilitate social mobility. Now, however, you know, many liberal uh, scholars are reluctant to discuss or research the role that culture plays in the negative outcomes found in, in, in the inner city. It's possible that they fear being criticized for reinforcing uh, the popular view that the negative social outcomes, you know, poverty, unemployment, drug addiction, crime, of many poor people in the inner city are due to the shortcomings of the people themselves. Indeed, you know, our panel member Orlando Patterson maintains that there is a, quote, deep-seated dogma that has prevailed in social science and policy circles since the mid-1960s, the rejection of any explanation that invokes a group's cultural attributes, its distinctive attitudes, values, and tendencies, and the resulting behavior of its members, and the relentless preference for relying on structural factors like low incomes, joblessness, poor schools, and bad housing, unquote. And Patterson claims that social scientists have shied away from cultural explanations of race and poverty because of their widespread belief that such explanations are tantamount to blaming the victim. That is, they support the conclusion that the poor themselves and not the social environment are responsible for their own poverty and negative social outcomes. But he contends it is utterly bogus to argue, as do many academics, that cultural explanations necessarily blame the victim for poor social outcomes. He argues that to hold an individual responsible for his behavior is not to rule out any consideration of the environmental factors, including historical environmental factors that may have evoked the questionable behavior to begin with. I fully agree. However, the use of a cultural argument is not without peril. Anyone who wishes to understand the American society must be aware that explanations focusing on the cultural traits of inner city residents are likely to draw far more attention from policymakers and the general public than structural explanations will. It is an unavoidable fact that Americans tend to de-emphasize the structural origins and social significance of poverty and welfare. In other words, the popular view is that people are poor or on welfare because of their own personal shortcomings. For example, a 2007 Pew Research Center survey revealed that fully two-thirds of all Americans believe personal factors rather than racial discrimination explain why many African Americans have difficulty getting ahead in, getting ahead in life. Just 19% blame discrimination. Nearly three-fourths of U.S. whites, a majority of Hispanics, and even a slight majority of blacks, 53%, believe that blacks who have not gotten ahead in life are mainly responsible for their own shortcomings. The strength of American cultural sentiment that individuals are primarily responsible for poverty presents a dilemma 
for anyone who seeks the most comprehensive explanation of outcomes for poor black Americans. Why? Simply because, as previously noted, cultural arguments that focus on individual traits and behavior invariably draw more attention than do structural explanations in the United States. Accordingly, I feel that a social scientist has an obligation to try to make sure that the explanatory power of his or her structural arguments is not lost to the reader and to provide a context for understanding cultural responses to chronic economic and racial subordination. Now consider, for example, the complex causal flow between structure and culture. In an impressive study that analyzes data from a national longitudinal survey uh, with methods designed to measure intergenerational economic mobility, the sociologist Patrick Sharkey, one of our former graduate students who's now at New York University, found that more than 70% of black children who are raised in the poorest quarter of American neighborhoods, that is the bottom 25% in terms of average neighborhood income, will continue to live in the poorest quarter of neighborhoods as adults. And he also found that since the 1970s, a majority of black families have resided in the poorest quarter of neighborhoods in consecutive generations compared to only 7% of white families. Thus he concludes that the disadvantages of living in poor black neighborhoods, like the advantages of living in affluent white neighborhoods, are in large measure inherited. Now we should also consider another path-breaking study that Sharkey co-authored with senior investigator Robert Sampson, who's in our Department of Sociology and uh, another colleague, Stephen Roddenbush of the University of Chicago, that examined the effects of concentrated poverty on black children's verbal ability. They studied a representative sample of 750 African-American children ages 6 to 12 who were growing up in the city of Chicago in 1995 and followed them anywhere they moved in the United States up to seven years. The children were given a reading examination and vocabulary test at three different periods. And their study shows that residing in a severely disadvantaged neighborhood cumulatively impedes the development of academically relevant verbal ability in children. And their results reveal, one, that the neighborhood environment is in an important developmental context for trajectories of verbal cognitive ability. Two, that young African-American children who had earlier lived in a severely disadvantaged neighborhood had fallen behind their counterparts or peers who had not resided previously in disadvantaged neighborhood by up to six IQ points, a magnitude estimated to be equivalent to missing a year or more of schooling, and three, that the strongest effects appear several years after children live in areas of concentrated disadvantage. And they point out that this research raises important questions about ways in which neighborhoods may alter growth and verbal ability, producing effects that linger on even if a child leaves a severely disadvantaged neighborhood. Now the studies by Sharkey and Samson and his colleagues both suggest that neighborhood effects are not solely structural. Among the effects of living in segregated neighborhoods over extended periods is repeated exposure to cultural traits, and that would include linguistic patterns, the focus of Samson et al. study, that emanate from or are the products of racial exclusion traits such as verbal skills that may impede successful maneuvering in the larger society. As Sharkey points out, and I quote, when we consider that the vast majority of black families living in Americans, America's poorest neighborhoods come from families that have lived in similar environments for generations, continuity of the neighborhood environment in addition to continuity of individual economic status may be especially relevant to the study of cultural patterns among disadvantaged populations." Unquote. Unfortunately, 
very little research has been given to these cumulative cultural experiences. You know, and this reminds me that it wasn't until I attended a panel discussion, a panel discussion at the University of Chicago in 1995 on Richard J. Hernstein and Charles Murray's controversial book, The Bell Curve, uh, Intelligence and Class in American Life, that I saw the most compelling reason for combining structural arguments with, uh, uh, for combining cultural arguments with structural arguments in order to construct a truly uh, comprehensive explanation of the social and economic outcomes of blacks. Now, in the bell curve, Hernstein and Murray found differences, found that differences, found differences in the test scores of blacks and whites, even after they included social environmental factors such as family, education, father's occupation, and household income in their analyses. They use this uh, difference in test scores to support the argument that the social and economic outcomes of blacks and whites differ at least in part because of genetic endowment, a position that suggests that African Americans are innately inferior. Now, to my mind, you know, none of the panelists gathered that day at the University of Chicago provided a satisfactory rebuttal. And I left the discussion thinking that Hernstein and, and Murray's argument for the importance of group differences in cognitive ability was based on an incredibly weak measure of the social environment. In other words, simply controlling for differences in family education, father's occupation, and household income hardly captures differences in cumulative social environmental experiences. Hernstein and Murray did not provide measures of the cumulative effects of race, including the effects of prolonged residence in racially segregated neighborhoods, the kinds of effects, kinds of effects that Samson, Samson talks about and Sharkey talks about. Now, to repeat, these cumulative effects are both structural and cultural, and they had not been adequately captured in the quantitative research on race and poverty that dominated debates at the time the bell curve was published. So thus, in addition to structural influences, exposure to different cultural influences in the neighborhood environment over time has to be taken into account if one is to really appreciate and explain the divergent social outcomes of human groups. But to repeat, in delivering this message, we must make sure that the powerful influence of structural factors do not recede into the background. Indeed, a fundamental question remains. What is the relative importance of these two dimensions in accounting for the formation and persistence of the inner city ghetto, the plight of black males, and the breakdown of the black family, three subjects that I focus on in my book? Culture matters, but I would have to say it does not matter nearly as much as social structure. You know, from a historical perspective, it is really hard to overstate the importance of racialist structural factors that Dr. Martin Luther King fought so hard against. You know, aside from the enduring uh, effects of slavery, Jim Crow segregation, public school segregation, legalized discrimination, residential segregation, the FHA's redlining of black neighborhoods in the 1940s and 1950s, the construction of public school projects in poor black neighborhoods, employer discrimination, and other racial acts and processes, there is the impact of political, economic, and policy decisions that were at least partly influenced by race. So when you contrast the combined impact of the structural factors with cultural factors, it would be very hard to argue that the cultural factors in the black community are equally as important in determining life chances or creating racial group outcomes. For example, if one attempts to explain rapid changes in social and economic outcomes in the inner city, there is little evidence that cultural forces have the power of changes in the economy. We only need to consider the impact of the economic boom on the reduction of concentrated racial poverty in the 1990s to illustrate this point. Now, policymakers who are dedicated to combating the problems of race and poverty and who recognize the importance of structural inequities face an important challenge. 
namely how to generate political support from Americans who tend to place far more emphasis on cultural factors and individual behavior than on structural impediments in explaining social and economic uh, outcomes. You know, after all, beliefs that attribute joblessness and poverty to individual shortcomings do not engender strong support for social programs to end inequality. Nonetheless, in addressing the problem of structural inequities, it would not be wise to leave the impression in public discussion that cultural problems do not matter. Indeed, proposals to address racial inequality should reflect awareness of the inextricable link between aspects of structure and culture. So for all of these reasons, it's extremely important. I think I'll end, instead of getting to Obama, I'll end and I wanted to wrap up with Barack Obama, but I won't. Let me just say this. For all of these reasons, it's extremely important to discuss how the issues of race and poverty are framed in public policy discussions, how we situate social issues in the larger context of society says a lot about our commitment to change. And a useful example of how this work comes to me from Robert Assens, a professor in the Department of Communications Art, Arts at the University of Wisconsin. He reminded me that the political framing of poverty, that is a way in which political leaders formulate arguments about how we as a nation should talk about and address issues of poverty in a New Deal era was quite different from the political framing of poverty today. We all know about the New Deal era. We associated poverty with the economic collapse of the economy. But today, poverty tends to be discussed in reference to individual initiative. And this distinction, he points out, reveals how larger shifts in society have influenced our understanding of the nature of poverty. And I was just going to talk about how I hope that Barack Obama will help to, you know, provide a more structural argument, but he combines both structural and cultural arguments in a very sophisticated uh, explanation of poverty. And his uh, framing of structure and poverty in that great speech he gave on race influenced the way I wrote the conclusion of more than just race. Thank you. Well, this is a real pleasure. Um, first of all, let me say um, to um, Bill, um, thanks for writing this work. Um, I think it's going to make a difference. Um, let me say also welcome to um, my end of um, <laughs> the struggle. Um, and um, it's really, um, it, it is really a, <laughs> a treat. And um, I, I was, as, as you know, I've, I've publicly expressed my appreciation of the book. I think you were uh, still on the beach in, 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 in Thailand when um, I, um, I, I complimented the work in a review I did recently in the Times. Um, so this, but um, let me say, first of all, uh, just very briefly um, summarize um, some of the key points because um, Bill sort of spoke in broader terms. Um, his objective, of course, is the need to take culture seriously, but to understand um, its relationship to um, structural forces. And he seeks to encourage the development of um, a framework for understanding, I'm quoting him, the formation and maintenance of racial inequality and racial group outcomes that integrate structural factors with two of the main types of structural forces those that directly ref reflect explicit racial bias and those that don't. Um, the, um, he, the fine culture in terms, which sounds very familiar, um, uh, my colleague, uh, who is only two doors down, um, uh, is, is uh, obviously very influential in, um, in, 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 in Bill's development of um, cultural framework. Uh, um, the, um, 
And basically, he keeps um, his, his objective is to see to what extent what is the relative weight of culture and structure in understanding the um, plight of um, African Americans. And we should say that the emphasis here is um, the what's being explained is uh, not black culture generally or blacks generally, but a particular um, set of problems which we identify with inner city blacks. And um, it's, 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 it's problematic whether one can, in fact, um, tease out what the relative weight of uh, each of these um, explanatory factors is, given how intimately intertwined they are. And I, I hope in a few minutes to indicate um, what, what, what I mean. Um, he looks at three important areas uh, in um, applying this integrated approach. Uh, concentrated poverty is one, and emphasizes the fact that concentration is a critical variable here, not just the existence of um, uh, black communities, um, there are many other ethnic groups um, exist in areas in which they, there's a predominance. There's a, there are still areas we are, which are predominantly Jewish, for example, and so on. But concentration of a particular group and concentrated poverty. And um, he emphasizes the structural nature of, um, of this um, uh, 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 implication of this fact. And he mentions um, in his talk, I don't have to go over this, um, some of the factors, um, some of the research, which um, lends weight to the view that concentration itself as a structural factor has very serious consequences. But his primary um, um, structural um, variables, um, joblessness, and um, the, um, the, the problem of um, um, uh, change in the nature of the economy, the shift towards a more post-industrial society, and globalization, and um, the departure of the middle class are all critical factors which, um, which account for uh, concentrated poverty. And however, and this is important, in explaining um, um, the way in which um, concentrated poverty work, I mean, culture is seen essentially as a dependent variable, as a dependent factor. So that even in discussing, uh, in discussing um, uh, Rob's work, um, the emphasis here is on the fact that um, there's a particular outcome um, which is cultural, but which is originally determined by, um, by structural factors. Um, the, um, he then shifts to, towards um, the specific problems of inner city African American males and um, uh, problems which are associated with um, that group, what is called footloose fatherhood, um, fragile families, and um, the problems of incarceration, problems of um, high dropout rates, and so on. Um, Again, while um, Bill concedes that there may be and there are um, important um, um, cultural dimension, he feels that, as he said, structural factors trump cultural ones. Um, poor schools explain why it is that um, African Americans, have, um, uh, uh, young African American men, have not um, been able to respond adequately to the demands of a change um, high skilled society and um, experience high unemployment. Um, so at this point that he mentioned um, a problem which I'll get to later. Um, <clears throat> my effort to explain um, the um, problems, uh, not only in cultural terms, but also to see the way in which historical factors may be critical are mentioned in this context and um, the critique of um, Elwood and Chris Jenks uh, of this approach is mentioned. I, I want to save that for later on. Uh, as well as um, Lamont and Small's approach to culture, which um, questions um, the degree to which one can speak of a distinctive um, set of cultural um, attributes as um, causal in understanding poverty. Um, 
Finally, he applies this approach to the family, the fragmentation of the family. This, in many ways, this is the most intriguing um, section of the book because the evidence which Bill accumulates insistently works against the structural approach. And one of the wonderful things about the book, in fact, is that he's scrupulously honest in um, acknowledging this data and in acknowledging the fact that um, in this integration of the structure and the cultural, that it would seem that um, cultural factors, as they would say, trump cults are structural, although in the end he says, nonetheless, I still think that structural factors may be the more important. Um, the, um, but the, the evidence here is, is pretty um, uh, 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 substantial um, in, 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 in a, trying to account for the high sort of fragmentation um, um, of, um, of, of, of black um, American um, families. And um, the, um, now, in his conclusion, I think there's one important point to note which perhaps is not sufficiently emphasized by Bill himself in his conclusion, is the fact that he has actually made a significant shift away from a position he's taken uh, most of his um, professional life uh, as to how one approaches the problem. Um, Bill has advocated strongly a race-neutral approach um, to uh, public policy, and um, it's one which I share myself. Um, but he feels that in light of this integrated approach, and um, the, 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 it is quite clear to him that there are distinctive um, cluster of problems pertaining to blacks which will require, I take it, um, a more, um, somewhat more nuanced approach, one which um, will um, have to acknowledge that they're in solving the problem, there are distinctive kinds of um, race-specific issues which we have to address. And he argues that um, some kind of political reframing might be necessary. Um, and um, uh, that um, perhaps um, there's some evidence to suggest that um, the time may be favorable in the sense that um, uh, while Americans typically with their individualistic um, bias are hostile to direct strategies such as affirmative action, nonetheless he cites work by Bobo and others which suggests that uh, uh, Americans um, white Americans may be more receptive to um, government policies which emphasize educational, um, expanded ed educational opportunities more. And um, so he's, um, he, he, and he suggests that Barack Obama might um, uh, adopt this um, position. Now this is a superb book um, that succinctly addresses an important issue that for too long has been avoided or treated with tender hooks by sociologists with the exception of a few renegades. It's also an honest work, as I mentioned. He explores all the available data and is not afraid of engaging the data, which works against him. Um, the, um, it's a reasonable attempt to integrate cultural and structural issues and has moved the discussion and the study of African-American problems significantly forward. There's no doubt about that. We don't have any, we, we agree more than we disagree, but there are areas of disagreement which I'd like to suggest a minute, or areas of concern. Um, one has to do with education. I found the explanation of education and educational problems uh, unsatisfactory. I think this is very important because when all is said and done, this may be the critical factor, the most critical factor. We live in a post-industrial society in which return education is becoming each day for more and more important for survival. And any group which is um, failing in this regard is in deep trouble. So this is central. And um, Bill's um, approach is to suggest that failing schools um, is, 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 is the problem. Um, he suggests that there's some historical basis for this in that um, uh, uh, the way the segregated schools sort of delegitimized black teachers and so on. I was not persuaded. Um, this is the least persuasive part of the book, but it should have been the most persuasive part of the book because I think it's the most critical problem. Um, the, um, and it's also interesting in that if one pushes it further, 
it turns out to be the area in which the integration of the culture and the structural might be um, might be might be the, um, the most important. And I want to draw your attention here to uh, uh, an interesting paper by um, the, the economist Stephen Cameron and um, James Heckman on the dynamics of educational uh, attainment for blacks, Hispanics, and whites. It was published in the journal Political Economy in 2001. And um, what they found was that short run um, uh, the um, economic factors, credit crunch, and so on, is not really the important um, factor explaining um, um, a lack of um, uh, black responsiveness to the demands of the educational system. Um, that Pell Grants are not going to work. <laughs> that by that time, it's already too late. Uh, however, this is, turns out, interestingly, that they're not another conservative um, attempt at um, dissing uh, efforts to improve education. Because, interestingly, and quite surprisingly, that they found that indeed resource factors and educational fact and, and, and um, familial resource factors, income, are indeed important. But earlier on, early on, much early, uh, that is to say, what is critical, and the model, the econometric model they developed sort of shifted from a kind of one-shot approach which just looks at the situation at the point of entry to college and said and asked, why is it that more blacks are not going in? And the answer being, well, they don't have the resources. I mean, what they found was that you have to go back to the earliest point because it's a cumulative process. At age six, you begin to see um, so differences that by 11 you begin to see greater differences. The differences in age six influences the differences in age 11. By 15 it's almost um, over. And so by the time you get to age 18 and to college, this is, if you look at a cumulative impact, it's uh, it's all gone. It's just simply not ready, and won't be. And the the, the, the white advantage is so great that it'll never catch up. So, but what they're saying then is that familial resources in the early period is what's critical. This is not just another conservative thing, it's their fault and so on. But here is the interesting thing. Where are these, what are these familiar resources? What are they? This is sort of, you know, family income in the early period, but there are no families there. I mean, the, the, the increasing number of blacks are being brought up by single um, mothers. And so what one, the question then becomes, Critically, this sort of frag family fragmentation we now see sort of has critical implication in via resources. Uh, it's almost, the equation goes the other way around, so the, the, the cultural problems, which are the heart of the familial problem, are mediated through economic factors accounting for uh, poor educational performance. I think this is fascinating. So we need, I, need, I think much more work needs to be done, and at least this is one of the areas we ought to look at in uh, more closely. Uh, secondly, Bill doesn't say very much about what is perhaps one of the most um, one of the most difficult areas uh, with respect to inner city blacks, especially inner city black men, and that is the problem of violence. This, the, 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 the rate of violence is, especially among young black, young black men, is um, is terrible. Um, and um, the thing about homicide um, is that it's, it's a fairly honest measure. It just sort of stands not less influenced by the kind of structural issues which Millie's talking about. I mean, you don't kill people for structural reasons, really. Um, it, it's, um, and it's, it's one of the things which most bothers me, and it's one of the major signals that there's something seriously um, 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 going on there, which, um, which 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 needs to be uh, addressed. I mean, and um, it's 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 not discussed, and it's one of the areas in which cultural and structural factors are, in a sense, if um, especially cultural ones, uh, most critical. The whole culture of the masculinity and emphasis on violence and um, aggression becomes very critical. Um, this, um, th the, this brings me to the issue of um, the explaining um, history, uh, the, the problem of continuity. And uh, I want to 
Okay, I think it's very important um, that um, um, I, I mention this because uh, my colleague and their friend, um, Chris Jenks and his colleague Elwood have repeatedly um, um, criticized the um, uh, point of me that the past becomes very, very important in understanding uh, present um, outcomes. And the, the, the criticism, um, which I've heard repeated many times and which Bill repeats in his book, is that it's problematic trying to account for um, present outcomes, even cultural outcomes, in other than structural terms, uh, in historical terms, because the fact that um, if you take, for example, the family and familial disintegration, um, the, um, how do we explain the fact that there was um, a relatively high rate of um, um, marriage among um, uh, blacks uh, up to the 60s, 50s, and 60s, and then it went down. How, how could um, something that happened in the past um, um, have this delayed effect? Well, um, it's very simple, and I really think it's important that both Bill and Chris and others who have uh, raised this issue understand it because it's going to be critical. In our, our, it's what I call conjunctural effects. I, the, the, the point is that, and by the way, I'm, I must um, thank one of my former students, uh, Andrew Clark West, who's worked on marital disruptions. Yeah, Orlando, could you speak to the mic? Yeah, all right. I want to mention the work of Andrew Clark West, who sort of was the first person to really sort of work this out in really great detail. That is, if you uh, take, say, a set of variables, um, the variables here are, um, that's just for the sake of the argument, um, mar the marriage rate, which we're trying to explain, uh, why it is that there's a sudden increase later on, how could that be explained by uh, early developments, education, and gender bias. Um, the, um, let's say education, the returns to education um, uh, on a scale of one to 10, say, um, the um, uh, gender uh, sort, of, uh, sort of measured by, let's say, a parameter in which there is um, um, little bias against, uh, or uh, negative bias against women, no bias against women, and um, bias in favor of women. And um, the male sort of masculinity, patriarchal set of attitudes, which I try to explain in terms of um, something that emerged very early and has persisted. Now, you have a, a, a parameter key here, which is very interesting, because what um, Andrew showed and what I, my other work have found is that you can have a cluster of variables, but over time, in different time period, the weights are significant will, will change, and may change in a way, even though you're dealing with the same cluster of variables, that they have opposite effects. And I mean, what they, they, in, in time one, let us say, which is inherited straight from slavery, in Jim Crow, you had a situation in which you have a highly patriarchal white society. You have blacks without land, without resources, desperate. Um, a bargain was made, but it was made on a patriarchal basis, that only men were given contracts. Now, um, in this situation, there are few returns to education. Although women were more educated than men, they got very little fight. There were not many jobs. The only job outside of the farm was, of course, uh, to work as a domestic, which was too close to slavery in, in both in time and appearance. Um, you also had a, a rural situation in which the norms are very strong and the church was strong, okay? In that situation, the woman had no choice but to put up with it. The man also wanted to get married, why? Because the only way you can make use of um, the land, which was quite abundant and which whites were prepared to give them as much as they want, wanted, was um, to to um, get labor. Women as producers and reproducers and their children. So you got married. And in a situation which you can always play the field even after you get married, there's nothing the woman could do, it's fine. And even today men will say, in fact, you know, I, I'd love to get married as long as a woman shut up and let me go do my thing. That was the situation she was in there. And so you had, yeah, high rate of marriage and high sort of fertility. You move to time two, same set of variables, but now 
the effect, the, the sort of, uh, the weights are very, very different. Returns to education become very important. Uh, women have more of it than men. There's a gender bias has shifted from the patriarchal Southern situation to one in which, if anything, from studies of there's a slight bias in favor of women in the workplace. Uh, um, and, uh, but the men's attitudes remain the same. This leads on, it has an explosive effect in the opposite direction. And so the same set of factors persisting can, in different periods, have very different outcomes. I, um, the, um, the, the, I think we need to take that into account. Now, let me finally sort of um, the, um, wrap. Essentially, what the, the argument which Bill has presented can be summarized here. And it's, um, it's one which I'm basically in agreement with. Macroeconomic factors um, lead to um, systemic factors do, um, well, sorry. Let me sort of back up a little. I have to um, here, Michelle, because this addresses um, the issue you raised. Um, first of all, the question of whether one can speak of a distinctive black culture, um, it, it seems to me, I, mean, it, it, I, I don't quite understand uh, what that's about. When we say something, a distinctive black culture, we don't mean that it is not shared with other cultures. Um, this, uh, most cultural attributes and processes are, in fact, shared. We're referring, uh, if you just look at his end diagram, sort of, I mean, there's sort of the, the total American culture generally. Black culture, in fact, incorporates a good deal of American um, culture. Uh, most of it, I'd say, um, is what we would call American. What we're talking about, uh, we talk about um, the, the issues of culture here, we're really concerned with that shaded segment, which includes um, some distinctive um, African-American um, uh, cultural processes, but may also include aspects of the um, dominant culture, um, which black Americans, as well as white um, uh, working class and low class kids are also sharing and having problems with. And that's what, the, it's that shaded area that we are um, concerned, that we are concerned with. Um, Bill's uh, approach is to argue that the macroeconomic um, systemic factors are critical in explaining those developments, as well as institutional racism. Um, and, that then, and that there's a feedback process which, um, which, which feeds back on inequality. Uh, essentially then, his, his, his argument is that even to the degree that we um, take account of cultural factors, uh, these are the direct result of what are their structural imperatives, if you like. So the argument in final analysis remains a very structural one. I mean, the role of um, uh, 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 the cultural forces um, in, in, um, in, 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 uh, as they're transmitted um, from past sort of um, uh, uh, patterns is, um, I think, neglected. But just as important, and I, I, I'll end on this point, uh, I think it's critical to understand that when we talk about culture, we're not talking about only inherited practices. Culture is constantly being produced and reproduced and, um, and are transmitted uh, not only horizontally but also intergenerationally. And they're transmitted in ways which are not necessarily just through inheritance in terms of a Bourdieuan kind of habitus. It's just one way in which they're transmitted. They're transmitted in the um, communicative process itself. Um, um, Stan Leverson has shown how cultural patterns are transmitted, if you like, and um, spread um, through um, frequency effect patterns and so on. And indeed, what I've concluded is that most of the most significant cultural um, processes, which we have to take account of, come not so much from inherited factors, although I've spent a lot of time looking at those, but from these intergenerational processes of cultural production, which, if anything, is um, extremely, the turnover is extremely high. The problem is almost the opposite of what um, one, one is always seeing. I mean, we we'll just forget this, um, this, the, the, the crude stereotype of the cultural approach, which is a cultural pattern formed in time one, which sort of remains constant, it is inherited in time two, and it's sort of really sort of determining what people do. That's not, in fact, that is in, in many ways turning out to be less and less the case with <coughs> black America. If anything, the problem is extreme cultural production um, and um, in an absence of stability in cultural processes. And, our task will be to really explore 
this process of uh, production and reproduction and the way in which they relate to the reproduction of inequality. And that's what I'm struggling with right now. But I want to say that it is wonderful that Bill has um, <coughs> drawn attention to the importance of this. And we sort of start what I think is a long overdue um, academic um, um, exercise, which is to examine this, the way in which culture works in explaining inequality. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know if you know this, Bill, but it's our uh, 20th anniversary this week that we met. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be nice to you if you be nice to me. <laughs> um, I'm going to try to shorten this a little bit so we have time for discussion. Thank you for uh, inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm going to read a little bit from an essay, um, that, um, and then I'll tell a little bit of uh, the story. So if you, I'll just start off. There is a detectable pattern in the consumption of the Wilson over Each treatise, a book or lecture, a set of lectures, manifests as a meditation on the social condition of the urban poor. Each contains both a diagnosis as well as, as, well as a core theoretical insight. And yet the theoretical insight, excuse me, and yet the theoretical thrust typically receives far less attention than the utility of the work for policymakers and those in their camp. In the declining significance of race, for example, a vigorous debate ensues concerning the independent impact of race in black mobility. But overshadowed is the innovative comparative historical approach that Wilson brings to the dry field of social stratification at that time. And as we gather today to appraise another Wilson monograph, I'd argue that we find ourselves at a similar crossroads. More than just race is certainly a meditation on the need to improve our policies towards urban poverty. But I think that the book evidences a key theoretical struggle in sociology and in the social sciences generally. Indeed, Wilson himself is not fully satisfied with his own earlier explanations for the reproduction of poverty, eschewing a top-down approach which builds theory primarily from demographic attributes of poor environments. Wilson begs us to take, quote, meaning, unquote, seriously as a component of social structure. He is asking us to no longer neglect the institutionalized expectations and understandings and perceptions that motivate everyday practice for those who live in poverty. This emphasis on meaning as a space of theoretical primacy opens up another space for a broad set of questions. Indeed, in my opinion, more than just race is signaling a long-awaited paradigm shift by calling for the need to revise the so-called human ecology, excuse me, human ecological framework that has defined American positivist social <coughs> science for over a century. To elaborate, almost 100 years ago, social science Scientists developed an approach to modern man that equated social systems with natural systems. The understanding of social practice that evolved was rooted in the belief that social interaction mirrored plant ecology. Just as plants competed for limited resources, so too did humans in urban areas compete over finite goods and services. The mediation between ecological forces and individual agency was often left underdeveloped, particularly as it concerned ideology, meaning, and frankly everything else that made us human. So Robert Park and Ernest Burgess famously discarded politics, quote, as sport, and left it out of their theory of this city entirely. Consider the two paradigmatic questions that float for Wilson and urban poverty scholars. Why does a young man deal drugs on the corner when reason would dictate that school is a better option? And why does the teenager decide to have a child when rational action would call for a delayed birth? The human ec ecological approach to social structure asks that we first look at collective properties of the environment, rates of home ownership and residential turnover, racial and ethnic mixing, and so on. These demographic properties then will generate theoretical propositions that can be applied to the conduct of the young man and woman. Specifically, a local ecology is where social control happens, where values spread, and where, quote, normative behavior, unquote, grows. The problem is that by following this logic, we invariably must explain inner city behavior as irrational, deviant, outside of the mainstream, or we under-theorize it by some public health metaphor, disease, epidemic, or contagion. In both cases, we're left to understand life by what is absent in this context, by what it is not, healthy, mainstream, and so on. No theory is very useful if it defines an entire population in negation. <coughs> 
More than just race suggests that to understand the life, thought, and behavior of the young man and woman, we need to recast our understanding of social and spatial structures in order to include the system of meaning that infuses, inflects, and shapes social practice. Wilson's argument suggests that we must take institutions seriously and we need to be attentive to the ways in which our objects are moving in time. Call this a historically constituted and institutionalized social structure. Call it culture, lifestyle, worldview, habit. It doesn't much matter for my present discussion. But the important point is that emerging from the book is that with a temporal focus, one that looks at institutionalized practices through which subjects seek meaning, we may be able to refashion our understanding of the link of spatial context to individual behavior. And I'm going to raise two discussions um, about this, um, one that has to do with social policy and the other um, that has to do with uh, the nature of the ways in which our cities are changing. Um, but first, let me tell you a brief story and, and return to this. Um, a little bit of a detour. Um, what Bill's work had made me think about was a case that I was trying to, that I've been dealing with for a long time, which are observations of African American entrepreneurs, small business persons in the south side of Chicago, the physical found for much of Bill's own work. These individuals all manage very small businesses, less than 25 employees or so, um, but they all rely on the, on the underground economy to stabilize their work. Um, a currency exchange owner charges a fee for residents wishing to sell bootleg movies in their store, for example, or a dollar store owner allows house painters to sit inside and advertise their services for a fee, and so on for funeral home directors, restaurant owners, and so on, so that the black market and the legitimate economy become deeply intertwined. In the human ecological tradition, social scientists could easily portray these behaviors as derivable from the collective properties of the neighborhood, the lack of jobs, inability to rely on peers, and so on. But the inner city shopkeepers that I was observing were not just adapting. In fact, they were pursuing shady opportunities um, out of preference, sometimes voluntarily, it seemed. For example, these shopkeepers were often reluctant to take, oppor take up opportunities that required them to leave the ghetto. Many said they preferred to stay within their own community, even if it meant a lucrative contract elsewhere. Or in other cases, they declined the outreach of banks and credit unions, preferring instead to patronize loan sharks or fellow shopkeepers, which meant that they preferred a 25% rate of interest loan or a 50% rate of interest loan than something from the bank. Or it could mean ho horse trading. If you, if you help me paint my store, I'll send a, my, one of my workers to your shop for a few hours to pack up boxes and so on. These seem to be irrational decisions on some level. Individuals are not taking up opportunities to increase their revenue. Instead, they're continually teetering on the brink of insolvency and increasing their risks by operating in the black market. They are, as Wilson might say, socially isolated with little prospect of developing capital that might catalyze a change. And what I wanted to know is why would these shopkeepers continue um, to um, work inside their communities, patronizing, for example, loan sharks or, in, or the black market for credit, when they could be taking up opportunities to leave their, er, leave their area. One of the clues that I found that helped me to explain this was not from Bill's work initially, but from Elliot LeBeau's work, um, work The Tally's Corner. Tally's Corner, excuse me. In his study of street corner men, LeBeau, LeBeau observed that each man comes to the world of work with a long history. And it's this historical focus that LeBeau uses to ground his study of why the men make particular decisions that they do. So he says that, a lovely quote, he says, many similarities between lower class Negro and son or mother and daughter do not result from cultural transmission but from the fact that the son goes out and experiences the same failures in the same areas and for much the same reason as the father. What appears as a dynamic self-sustaining cultural process is in fact a simple piece of social machinery which turns out in rather mechanical fashion independently produced lookalikes. So for us, one could say that we don't meet our subjects fresh, we don't interview them fresh out of the box, but they're repositories of particular social structures that define their possibilities for action. We can call these aspirations, dispositions, expectations, but the important point is that these structures of the life world can't be read off the demographic properties of the space they inhabit, as ecological models of sociality push us to do. It's the system of meaning, their perceptions, their entire moral universe that matters. So returning to the shopkeepers, we might say that the, these men were not the first, in the, in their, the first in their communities to see businesses open up and fail. They had seen, seen individuals around them continually struggle to remain solvent. They'd seen parents and aunts continue to do so. And nearly everyone they had seen operate a business had decided to stay put, remaining local, relying on friends and neighbors to start another, another business. 
so that insolvency and failure do not become linked in a conventional moral fashion such that, such that they experience great shame by claiming bankruptcy. Instead, it's not immoral to fail, but it is immoral if you fail to pick yourself up and start again. And it's the system of meaning that becomes part of the social structure that animates their behavior. So that what looks like an irrational act relying on loan sharks or friends for a loan becomes quickly a, an, a rational act when you look at it from the point of view that what they're trying to do is embed themselves in a system of debt. The capacity to rekindle a business initiative after they quote fail is straightforward. Find somebody that owns you money and call in your debt. If it's not available, find a third party broker, meaning a route that requires little paperwork, no background check, and minimal collateral. These are the surefire ways to remain a viable business person. So in this way, these shopkeepers become embedded in a sphere of ir illegitimate underground activity. And the premise driving their aspirations is that the normative time horizon of ghetto business is three to five years. In this context, the sign of success is the capacity to start another business in years four to six. Like LeBeau, Wilson, in More Than Just Race, emphasizes the need to understand the historical processes through which perceptions and expectations form. Listen to his statement, which sounds very much like LeBeau. Quote, parents in segregated communities who have had experiences with discrimination and disrespect may transmit to chil children through the process of socialization a set of beliefs about what to expect from life and how one should respond to circumstances. In the process, children may acquire a disposition to interpret the, world, interpret the way the world works that reflects a strong sense that other members of society respect them because they're black. Disrespect them. I'm sorry, did I get that one? Disrespect them. Yeah. Dis oh, I apologize. Going back to our paradigmatic examples, a young man in the drug economy and his teenage mother, we find that Wilson is attentive to historically constituted social structure so that he recasts inner city behavior, young black males disdain for low wage jobs or their use of violence, without pointing simplistically to a discrimination or a deficit in values. A young man, a young man works in the drug economy not because he lacks values or adheres to an entirely different system of values. Indeed, values may have none, nothing to do with it. But it's certainly, there are few neighbors and friends who have social connections. Many of his friends and neighbors are probably connected to the drug trade and so on. Survival and peer pressure dictate that a man will seek out dangerous, illegal jobs. Is this delinquent? Certainly. But more likely, it's a comprehensible response to the lack of opportunity and is driven by what Gertz observed along many years ago, namely that we are at our core seekers of meaning. So let me conclude um, with two questions for Bill that um, stem from this work and which I think follow from his attempt to take meaning and make it as central as demographic attributes of the neighborhood that he's studying in theorizing social behavior. The first is how do we link policy and culture either in our analyses of social policy or in the norm normative claims that are used to undergird policy formulation. More than just race is short on specifics. But perhaps Bill might offer us additional clues as he develops his thinking. Consider, for example, housing mobility initiatives, a very prominent social policy. Millions of dollars have been spent moving poor families out of the ghetto and perhaps as much to study the policies themselves. But there's relatively little focus on the meaning of mobility for the poor, what Rob Sampson has termed the subject's, quote, attachment to place. Plenty on outcomes, but precious little effort to think about social ecology from the standpoint of those experiencing residential mobility. Thus, we are left wondering at the end of the day why it is that poor boys return to the neighborhood of origin to commit delinquent acts even after they move. Millions of dollars could have, prob could have better, be millions of dollars could have been better spent if researchers actually examined the meaningful attachment to neighborhoods that these young men had formed before relocating. Second, our cities have changed dramatically, and what, so what might be the implications for policies targeting the urban poor? And this is my final comment. To cite several transformations, suburbs are the fastest rising space of impoverishment, particularly for the minority poor. The central core hosts the most intensive de urban development, attracting the middle and upper classes once again. However, our systems for understanding race still hew to a 20th century ecological paradigm, inner city poor, wealthy suburb, and so on. If we are to reconfigure our understandings of spatial determinants of social be behavior, we will need to alter our conceptual approach to urbanism to take into account globalization the reconfiguration of nation-state boundaries, and the complexity of international financial markets, all of which have changed the spatial basis for our lived experiences. Categories like neighborhood and community study, both of which have given me a steady paycheck, to be sure, may not be outdated, but they do sound quaint, and they may soon sound nostalgic. I don't expect Bill's book to resolve this dilemma, but we do need a little theoretical refurbishing. <laughs>
To conclude, Bill's book raises the need to support research on social problems at work at the conjuncture of three aspects of social structure, institutionalized practices, the social organization of meaning and perception, and demographic spatial attributes. This is not an easy task, and there are not many models around, although we need no look further than Rob Sampson's work in the PhDCN project to see how this can be done. In Sampson's project, subjective perceptions, specifically levels of trust or shared expectations of social control, are as important as the, quote, objective indicators of neighborhood ecology in shaping behavior. True, neither meaning or interaction are observed phenomena in that project per se, but the theoretical apparatus could certainly be moved in that direction. I've got more to say, but let me conclude and then give it over to Bill and questions. Thank you again for the invitation. I'm going to ask Bill to take uh, just a few minutes to answer, so we have at yeah. least 15 minutes for debate. Yeah, I'll be I'll be uh, relatively uh, brief. Uh, these were very thoughtful comments, and uh, uh, I really appreciate uh, uh, hearing them. Uh, very quickly regarding Orlando's comments, he felt like I should tease out the relative weights of uh, the explanatory factors, structure, and culture, and he points out the evidence that. Uh, that I accumulate uh, in discussing the impact of structure versus culture on the family works against my argument that structure is more important than culture. Um, I do hedge a bit, he's correct, I do hedge a bit in that chapter. I state, uh, you know, in previous chapters I argue that the available evidence suggests that structural factors are more important than cultural variables. Uh, as revealed in this chapter, the structural evidence for the fragmentation of poor black families is not as compelling. Okay, I make that point, but I also say, uh, nonetheless, uh, um, the research on African American families uh, provided in this chapter provide little reason to conclude that cultural variables have played a greater role than structural factors in black fam family fragmentation. Now, Orlando and I can argue about the evidence that I present, uh, but I will concede this. Uh, the evidence provided in the chapter on the family is not as compelling as the other chapters on the importance of structure. Uh, the uh, problem of uh, education, yeah, I agree. I, w I really should have placed more emphasis uh, on education. Um, uh, I talk about it, but and I, I was sort of influenced by Catherine Neckerman's uh, work, uh, who s wrote this book that shows, tries to d detail the historical factors that explain uh, how black families learn to uh, develop a distrust toward the schools and um, develop cultural uh, framing about uh, public education that uh, some people might consider are problematic, and she showed very systematically how the accumulation of, uh, of uh, racial oppression uh, led uh, black families to become disillusioned. Um, now there should be more research like this. There is very little uh, research that shows the historical impact of the development of cultural attitudes toward uh, education. Um, now. I agree that I should have placed more emphasis on the education factor, and in a paper that I wrote for Michelle Lamont and her colleagues coming out in the Annals of American Academy of Political Science, where I use, developed some of the arguments uh, in uh, more than just race, but I conclude with a fairly detailed discussion of uh, the relationship, by the way, uh, Sudair, between culture and structure and education, that's the, the Harlem Children's Zone. You see, and I, 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 I don't have time to talk about the Harlem, maybe it would come up question and answer period, but the Harlem Children's Zone reflects a kind of holistic approach that I think that we have to take if we're gonna talk about addressing uh, these issues through a public policy perspective. The Harlem Children's Zone combines both structural and cultural uh, innovations, and uh, if I, uh, I wish I had included that in more than just race. Quickly, violence among young black men. Uh, I don't talk about it a lot. Uh, I must say, Orlando, you know, watching The Wire, HBO's The Wire, uh, <laughs> I really appreciated the cultural influence uh, uh, in uh, accounting for the uh, 
the systematic uh, killings. Uh, and uh, why didn't I elaborate more in the book? Very little research. Very little good research on the cultural aspects of homicide. Okay, but I might have said more about it. I, uh, I agree with that. Let me conclude with the uh, conjunctural effect, you, you know, uh, that, uh, that you outline here. Uh, this is a, this is a powerful, uh, powerful argument. I think you, you, you take it a little bit further than, than what you did uh, previously. Uh, but I still raise the issue that uh, these cultural continuities are difficult to substantiate empirically. You know, I still don't think that you've spelled out the mechanisms what mechanisms are operating that transmit weak family structures across generations. And what I would conclude, this is still a very important hypothesis that we need more research, and uh, you've provided some direction in that respect. Great, thank you so much. So we have uh, two uh, people here carrying mics. So if you uh, lift your hand, I will, uh, ask these people to come to talk to see you. So we have one person here, and please identify yourself. And second, we have someone here. Yes. Uh, Kwame, Kwame Zulu Shabazz, Department of Anthropology. Uh, my, my question, or I want to question the sort of, um, I guess the common sense idea that, that there's poverty in the inner city and, and there are lots of poor black people, therefore we should study black people who are poor to get at this question. And, and, my, my, I, and, and in challenging this idea, I wanted to invoke uh, two people who have uh, connections with Harvard University. That is Carter G. Woodson, who got his doctorate here in both the miseducation of the Negro, and Malcolm X, who spoke, who gave lectures here, at least two lectures, I believe. Now, Carter G. Woodson points out that in terms of education, he doesn't put it this way, but for me, um, he's saying that a place like Harvard is also a, a cultural space where black people or non-white people have to become culturally competent in white normative ideas about knowledge. And, and further, that this knowledge reflects the interests of white Americans, right? So it's not a neutral space of learning. It's a space that reflects the interests of white people. Um, and on violence, Malcolm X pointed out that America um, is a belligerent nation and it, it, it exports violence all over the world. And it's been at war with black people since we've pretty much been here. And so my, Can I my, ask you to come to point because there's a number yeah, the, of people. And so, the, and so the, the point of my question is that, is that perhaps we need to study the culture of, for example, um, what seems to be normative in these, these questions, white upper middle class culture as a way of, if we don't study or pay attention, pay attention to what we consider normative, white middle class, upper middle class normative culture, we miss, I think, a lot of why black Americans are poor in inner cities. Great, thank you. So in the interest of giving a chance to a few people to exchange comments, I'll collect a few questions and then I'll ask you to, uh, so there's a person here. Hi, my name is Michelle Sternthal. I'm a postdoc at Harvard School of Public Health and um, I got my PhD in sociology from University of Michigan. And I was just wondering whether you could speak to um, the works of Arlene Geronimus and things that were that she was informed by, like Carol Stacks, ta taking a cultural perspective from a framework of um, cultural adaptivity to what would be called deviant behavior. And so her fr her idea of teen pregnancy as a culturally adaptive model to the higher risks um, associated with weathering, and where that both in a, a larger social science framework, how the works of things like what she's written plays a role as sort of giving um, serious weight to culture, but in a way which does not problematize culture, but actually looks at it as an adaptive response to harmful structural uh, conditions. Okay, you want to respond to these two points before we move on? Orlando? Uh, okay, I mean, on the first question, if you, you remember my Venn diagrams there, I mean, um, most of the, the African American circle overlapped the dominant um, cultural circle. And, um, uh, and 
with respect to violence, you're absolutely right. In fact, there's a, a I think a pretty good book by Cartwright called Violent Land, which argues in fact that there's close link between um, um, the uh, violence of this this country was born. The West, uh, we, we, we romanticize it in the cowboy movies now, but it is really uh, a rural version of the ghetto, ghetto violence. And in fact, um, it shows that the sort of honorific culture which you know was on display as men stood up and sort of shot each other for looking them the wrong way is we see clearly in the don't diss me or I'll shoot your attitude. So it's, it's very very American, and um, uh, there are structural factors involved um, where you have a high proportion of youth uh, in, in factors which with sort of poor um, institutional constraint you're going to have violence. But there's also a cultural element coming from the dominant culture, a strong emphasis on honorific behavior. Which is, so that, that, uh, that, that you, you, I, mean, I, I fully agree with, um, with, with, with you on that. Yeah, I just want, uh, uh, on Arlene and Geronimo's, uh, I think she's a very creative scholar and introduced an interesting perspective on the cultural adaptation of teen pregnancy. Uh, but the question I ask myself after reading her work, and the question I would put to anyone who takes that position, is, um, yeah, you, you don't problematize culture, but the question I have is, um, what future do the kids have who, uh, who are raised by the teen parents, who are, who are poor and have no resources? Um, I think that's a very important question. Uh, and a lot of the mothers who have children out of wedlock, uh, poor women, you know, I, I, I try to explain this away, but nonetheless, they fail to recognize the disadvantages that will ultimately affect their children's chances in life. And that's, that's something that I look at. You know, when I think about what I call the principle of equality of life chances, uh, would you agree uh, that in our society, a person should not be able to enter a hospital ward of healthy newborn babies and on a basis of race or class uh, predict those children's eventual position in society. For a lot of these women who have poor women who have uh, single mothers, uh, uh, the chances that their kids are going to succeed are not very good. Uh, and if you're able to do that, and I think you can pretty much, uh, if you're able to enter a hospital ward of newly born babies uh, from the inner city ghetto and predict their outcome, uh, then you can say that this is a very unfair society. So as Geronimus's argument is strongly supporting the structural position, isn't it? <laughs> There's someone at the back here. Hi, I'm Paul Peterson. I'm a professor in the government department here and also at the Kennedy School. And uh, Bill, I'd like to um, bring up the education question uh, again uh, because the uh, the National Assessment of Educational Progress tracks the educational performance of white and Hispanic and African American students from 1970 down to the present. And there was this time, I'm sorry, there was this time when the, the NAEP scores, which these are called, showed uh, remarkable gains for African American 17 year olds. Uh, starting in the 70s up through 1990. And the improvement in those scores was so rapid that had the trajectory continued beyond 1990 down to the present time, uh, African-American test score performance at age 17 would be at least equal to that of whites, which have remained flat over this entire period of time. There's been no change in the test score performance of white students. But what happened in 1990 was that um, there was no further gains. And in fact, uh, there's been uh, deterioration in black test score performance in both reading and math since 1990. Not quite to go back all the way down, but you know, a very substantial decline. And it's not just a one-time measurement. It's several measurements are showing this. Despite the fact that the 1990s are a period of economic growth. So, I'm just, you know, what insights would you, is your analysis, how would you connect 
that. I mean, to me, this is one of the great puzzles as to uh, what can, what's happening in education, how does education function. So I'm just wondering if you have any You begin in 1980, that. what happens? Beginning in 1980? Yeah. If you look at the data from 1980, what happens? Well, it's improved uh, dramatically during the 1980s. From 19 it improves dramatically during the 1980s? Up, up till about 1988. And this is disaggregated, right? Or you're just talking about blacks as a group? And you don't disaggregate to look at inner city schools, huh? This is nationwide. Nationwide, yeah. Yeah, yeah. it'll be interesting to see if the same pattern uh, probably does holds up if you disaggregate and you look at, for example, what's happening to uh, uh, the educational performances of black kids in inner city schools that have experienced incredible, uh, in neighborhoods that have experienced incredible depopulation as a result of the continued out-migration of uh, higher income families so that you have a much greater concentration of poverty uh, in these schools than you did in earlier periods. But I just raised the question. Right. <laughs> Unfortunately, the NAEP data over that period of time, you can't disaggregate. It's just you now can do it for the last <coughs> few years, but you can't do it for that period but of time. But it's a very so. interesting question. And are you addressing it? <laughs> well, uh, you know, uh, 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 President uh, Obama might have in his speech to children <laughs> in which he uh, talks about trying to change the culture. And the question that I, has come to my mind is, was, was there a civil, did the civil rights movement provide a leadership that was very encouraging to young people and gave them hope, suggesting that there really, these structural factors were not so powerful that they could not, you could not somehow rise above them in the way that Obama has suggested. Uh, but then after 1990, you don't have that kind of leadership. You have, to the extent that you have a, well, let me just leave it at that. You don't have that same leadership. Very interesting question, Paul. Can be called the Reagan effect. <laughs> no, 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 but I, I think the Cameron, Cameron and Heckman um, paper I mentioned will be relevant here because they take into account of the lag. I mean, it makes sense. I mean, if, if it is true that it's resources in the family early on that is driving educational performance later on, um, one w would see the explosive growth of um, single parenting and therefore declining resources um, in, the, in, in the family as a, as a decisive factor. If I may add something, I think the, the, the example you just provided might suggest that we could think about the question of the relation between culture and structure as varying from case to case. So that you know, if, if one examines empirically uh, this specific period, we could think about a multi-causal explanation that would switch the, the weight that is given to both sets of, not variable, but dimensions. And uh, you know, I'm just throwing this as a, a question in terms of how, the question, how we frame the question. Should we continue to frame the question in terms of the general, you know, which is essentially a Marxist question, right? The relative autonomy of culture in relation to social structure versus analyzing on a case-by-case -case basis how those different dimensions uh, weigh into the outcome. Jennifer, did you want to, do you? The education question. There is other evidence, and I don't know if it's connected with the NAEP data or not, that in fact, y your point about inner city schools is, is a critical piece of this story, which is to say that there is increasing class segregation, uh, preaching to the, I mean, this is bringing Coles to Newcastle here, uh, class separation, uh, both in the black and white communities, and so that in fact, the big gains in African American test scores were largely outside inner cities. Why they stopped in 1990, this doesn't answer. But the fact that inner city schools on balance have either, if you disaggregate NAEP data by class, setting aside race, uh, the middle and upper proportions do much better and the bottom fraction of the population, depending on how you count, either does equally badly or gets worse off. There are other data, actually, yeah. Anyway, so I, I think part of the story has to do with separation of schools and communities and neighborhoods and a whole set of things. And that's both structural and cultural in some complicated way. And Rhonda, I may be actually quoting you, citing you when I talk about all this. So maybe Rhonda. The, the, the Ron Ferguson, Ron Ferguson, the Graduate School of Education and the Kennedy School. The, um, 
the patterns during the 80s, you can disaggregate the trends in the NAEP, and they're pretty much the same no matter how you cut it, even for kids who have gone to private schools. They, they're very much the same. Um, and the gaps in the NAEP are the biggest among the children of the most educated parents. Okay? So the gaps in the NAEP are the largest among the children of the most educated parents. And the gaps are widening? So they're, they're bigger. The, the, the performance of children whose parents have only a high school degree, are, those are more similar between blacks and whites than is performance levels among kids whose parents have college degrees. Black kids whose parents have college degrees, or report that their parents have college degrees in the NAEP, have lower test scores, reading, math, and science, than white kids who report their parents have no more than 12 years of schooling. Okay, so it's not just an inner city problem. Very interesting. So I think our time is up, so I'll ask um, Bill if you want to add anything. Uh, want to talk about Obama? <laughs> <laughs> no, I just want to say that um, I hope that uh, Barack Obama's uh, agenda, his, 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 his plate clears up a bit so that he can, uh, he can begin to provide the kind of uh, leadership we need to address issues of race, including the issues of race and, uh, and education. Um, I'm very excited about Arne Duncan as his Secretary of Education, and these people are really trying to, to address some of these issues. And uh, it would be interesting to uh, raise uh, Paul's question with Arne Duncan the next time we, we talk to see the extent to which the administration is also aware of this real puzzle. Well, please join me in thanking uh, Orlando Severe and Gary.